had two children. So Paul uh, has five children now that are all walking with the Lord, and it is our privilege to have Paul Koistra with us this morning. Paul, let's give him a welcome. Thank you, brother. I have to have this because God didn't give me the memory he gave your pastor, so uh, he can preach from memory, but I have to have notes, so we'll do that. I wonder if I'm the only person here wearing a tie. Uh, (laughs) If I am, I am going to go casual. You ready? (laughs) There you go, huh? All right. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I knew I could do it. Um, <laughs> I want to tell you about the seminar tomorrow because it is part of what we're doing here and even part of what I'm preaching on because I'm preaching on stewardship. And if you come to that seminar tomorrow, you will probably make as great a stride in, um, in stewardship as you've made in many, many years. Uh, this, you, if you go through the process, you will get a design for your own a state, and you ought to do it whether you're young, middle age, or older like I am. I've just done it for the third time. First time I did it when I had children, uh, and I, we needed to make sure that if something happened to us, the children would be taken care of. We knew who would be, they would be living with and who would be guiding them. Second time I went through it, of course, uh, my first wife passed away. I remarried and needed to do it again, and then recently I did it. Uh, because I wanted to get a few things in line, and most of what I had done was for the state of Missouri where I used to live, and for 20 years I hadn't really updated in relationship to, to Georgia, and Georgia has different laws and so on, so I did it again. This is the best conference on estate planning that you could go to. If I had time, but I have to be through at, at uh, 11.53, or they'll do that, so... If you come tomorrow, I will tell you why it is the best. It really is the best. It is free. That's not why it's the best, but it is free. Uh, That is the meal and the plans. They're they're not without cost, but you get it for free. Secondly, there's no pressure. No one will ever ask you or tell you where you should give or encourage you to give. This is not a plan where we try to get money for uh, Oak Mountain Presbyterian Church or Mission of the World or anything else. This is a gift from Mission of the World. I don't know anybody else doing it um, in the entire world. Uh, Most everybody has got it there for a purpose, and the purpose is more development. But we're trying to bless you, and most Christian people need this help. Many don't even have wills. If they have wills, um, they haven't updated them. They haven't thought about ministry in their wills, all kinds of things. So I hope you'll be there. We have 12 places left in the first one, although maybe they can produce more food. And we have 21 in the second one. Uh, the morning service uh, was quite, uh, quite productive. Actually, I thought I was going to be eating a lot of meals before the first service, so we're thankful for that as well. But sign up when you go out, please. Now, I'll tell you about two men they were sailing, and they got into a really bad storm. They shipwrecked on a desert island. There was nothing there. And one man began to yell, we're going to die, we're going to die. And the other man said, calm down, calm down, we're going to be all right. The man said, no, there's no food on this island. There's no water on this island. We're going to die. And the other man said, please calm down. You don't understand. I make $500,000 a year, and I tithe, and my pastor will find us. Now, I tell that joke for a purpose. It's not just to get you to laugh. Usually in a church, we do two things about money. We either don't say anything, that means we're silent, or we kind of joke about it because we're a little embarrassed to talk about money. The surprising thing is God was never... uh, shy about it. God talks about money all over in the Bible, and he's very concerned about it. In the text that we're going to read, Jesus, I think, had their attention. He says, do not lay up your treasure on earth. You know, when you talk about treasure, people get excited, right? I mean, everybody likes like to find a treasure. Wouldn't you like to stumble over something like that? There's somewhere around here, they tell me, there's an oak mountain. 
If you took $1,000, buried it on Oak Mountain, and told people that if they could find it, they could have it, people would come with shovels and picks and everything else, and pretty soon there wouldn't be any Oak Mountain. There'd just be Oak Molehill, you know, because people would level a thing to find a $1,000 treasure. That's the way people are. In the History Channel, you can actually, on a weekly basis, look at a program called uh, Oak Island. Uh, you know, I don't know why anybody watched the thing because actually these are, it's two men and a bunch of people with them digging and digging and digging and it's been going on for years now and they haven't found anything. But the truth is it's been going on for centuries. There's a money pit there and they are convinced uh, that, that uh, the Knight Templars uh, buried all their money in there and so on and uh, six people have died trying to find that treasure. John Wayne invested money in a, in a company some years ago to try and find that. Uh, you see what I'm saying? Everybody likes a treasure. But God is talking about treasures here because he is concerned that you and I understand what he thinks about our money and by understanding that, then how we ought to think about our money. God does not want to make you feel bad. He's not trying to steal from you. He's not trying, you know, to deprive you anything. When God talks about money in the Bible, you know what he's concerned about? He wants to bless you. He wants you to be happy. He wants you to know the joy of taking that which God has given you and using it in ways that build you up, that in many ways draw you closer to him and you see other people's lives changed as well. That's really what this is all about. And I think this text is a very good one because I think it helps us to really get some direction about how we handle that which God has given us. You know, if you're going to deal with anything, you've got to read the directions first. And when God is talking to us about money, we've got to know what his directions are. Recently, my wife wanted to have a dimmer switch put into the family room and I'm the kind of person, I've been doing this for years, my first wife got after me all the time too. I open up the package, I work like crazy, when it doesn't operate the way it's supposed to, then I get out the directions, read the directions, and say, oh yeah, that's what the problem was. So this time I got it out, uh, I, first I took the old switch out, and there, there were two wires, a black and a white, and they were attached on the right side of the switch, and I thought, well that's simple. I pulled out the new switch, and it had two terminals right there on the right, I did notice there was a terminal on the left too, but what the world, the other one worked like this, so I thought that'd be all right. Listen, I did what I should have done all the time. I thought maybe I ought to figure this out. I got out the directions and read it. I don't know what would have happened if I'd have put both of them over here, because one was supposed to go here and one go here. I did it that way. Maybe it's a good thing. I probably wouldn't be here, you know, if I had uh, not read the directions. God wants us to understand his directions concerning what he has given us. And he gives us directions all over in the Bible. 36, excuse me, 16 of 38 parables deal with material things. Think about that. Jesus taught in parables. 16 of his 38 parables, he's talking about material things. I wonder why. Maybe material things are important, you think? Huh? And he spoke more about material things than he did about heaven and hell. Again, I wonder why. Because maybe it's important. Let's read the word of God and I'll ask you to stand while we read his word from Matthew chapter 6 verses 19 and following. This is God's word. Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroys and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body, so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we do believe that this is your word, written by Matthew through the power of the Holy Spirit, 
We do believe that when we studied in worship, it's very special because we believe it's as if you were here speaking to us. We pray then to that end that it will be so, that you will send your spirit. We pray that in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, first, we see in this text that God is concerned about how we invest the money he gives us. This is part of the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is often called the Ten Commandments of the New Testament. It is really instructions, three chapters, five, six, and seven, and they are instructions on how to live in God's kingdom. What does it mean to be a kingdom person and live as a kingdom person? And when you read this, you do realize uh, pretty quickly, if you read at all, you don't even have to be careful in your reading. This, this is radical stuff. I mean, it starts out uh, with things like um, the poor shall inherit the kingdom of heaven, or the meek shall inherit the earth, or anger is the same as murder, or lust is the same as adultery, or one that I, seems awfully uh, radical to me, you should love your enemies. Not just the people you like, you should love your enemies. And then, and this may be the most radical thing in the entire sermon on the mount, and that is you're to pray to God as if he was your father, our father, who art in heaven. That's part of this sermon on the mount. But here he's talking about what he gives us. And he tells us that our goal should not be to be rich. Our goal should not be that we focus our life on the things of this world. Our, our, our life should not be simply about temporal things, but we ought to be oriented with, on eternal things. That's where our eyes ought to be. I, I like to put it this way. God makes us material beings. You're a material being. You're physical. God made you that way. You're part of his physical world. You can test yourself to make sure you pinch yourself, and if you can feel yourself, you're a material being. And if you can't feel yourself, well, that's a problem too, but uh, we'll deal with that later. Now, he's also created this material world, and it is a beautiful place. When he made it, he said that, he, uh, that it was good. In his eyes, it was even good that it was beautiful. So he takes material beings, he puts them in a material being that is very good. Then he says, don't be a materialist. Now, what's he mean by that? He means don't fall in love with the things that I've made and the things I've given you. Let your love be to me. Love the creator, not the creation. And that's the foundation of what he's saying here. And do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroys. He's not saying these things aren't important. He's saying they're very, very important. But because they're very, very important, you need to keep them in the right place. The second thing he says here uh, that we see here is that Christ makes the joy of stewardship easy. He makes it easy. What I mean by that, it's very simple. He says that here, doesn't he? He says, you got a choice, and it's just this or this. Either you invest here in this temporal world or you invest in eternity. In other words, what he's saying is your choice is, is it going to be heaven or is it going to be earth? And those who are not in Christ, those who have not have surrendered their lives to God, they have no choice. They, they are not ever going to be able to decide heaven or earth. All they've got is earth. You see, they live in this world, and there's nothing beyond this world. They count their days, and those days are all that they have. In verses 22 and 23, it even says they live in darkness. That is, they don't have understanding about things as they really are. My wife and I, we are we're, uh, going through a devotional by Cheryl Ford on Pilgrim's Progress. And you know that story about Christian. He left the city of destruction. He's on the way to, the, to this uh, celestial city. And uh, we've been working on it. I, we're about halfway through now. It takes a whole year to get through. It's 365 days. Uh, but uh, we've finally got through Vanity Fair. Um, and uh, Faithful was martyred there 
But now Hopeful, he's met up with a new man, Hopeful, and so Hopeful and Christian are marching along, and, and a bunch of other people come behind them. And, and when they look back, the, these people look very sophisticated. They do have ties on. <laughs> and uh, they, they uh, and, and, and they, uh, you know, they're, they're fine speech. They're just, they're just refined people, kind of people like you'd like living next door to you. And, uh, and they're heckling Christian, and they're heckling hopeful because they don't seem to have it. They haven't figured it out yet. What they're saying is that God gave us gifts, and God gave us, gave us talents, and God allowed us to make all this money. And, and so we've done what God expected us to do. And look at those silly pilgrims up there. Their clothes are kind of ragged, and they don't, they don't seem to have it. I mean, they keep looking ahead. They keep looking at this for this place called the Celestial City, and, and they're not enjoying what's here. And of course, what's the point that Bunyan's trying to make? Well, the two pilgrims up there, they're the ones that have it figured out. Mr. Buy-ins and Mr. Money Love and so on back here, they're going to perish with all of that, and it's all going to be a waste. You see, if we're in Christ, all things are new. And, and, and so we live in this world too, but we don't belong to this world. We number our days, but our days don't end here. And we live in the light because we're guided by the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. The third point that I would point out here is nothing has a greater potential to disrupt your spiritual life and stunt your spiritual growth than investing your money only in this life, in the things of this life. Jesus says, do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroys and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and do not steal. And what Jesus is saying is that where your, where your treasure is, that's where your heart is going to be. Where your treasure is, it's where your heart is going to be. Now, that doesn't really sound right, but Luther used to preach a sermon, and, and Luther did say a lot of funny things, but, but Luther used to preach a sermon where he'd say, if I can win a pocketbook, I can win a soul. Now, that doesn't sound right. I mean, it, it should go the other way. If somebody's soul is right, then they're going to get their money right. I wonder why Luther would preach that way. Well, it's because really what Christ is emphasizing here as well, and, and that is that where you put your treasure in many ways is where your heart is going to be. It impacts your heart and your relationship with God. Uh, and every day in so many ways we decide what we're going to worship. We decide what's going to be important to us. We decide what's going to give meaning and purpose in our lives. What is it that we're going to build our lives on? And again, the choice is God or the things that God made. That's really what this text is talking about. Calvin said our problem is that the human heart is an idol factory. That is, that we begin all the time to worship things that God has made, good things even that God has given us, but not God himself. And whenever we do that, of course, we put an idol between ourselves and God. We have to back off of that and be careful that we lay up our treasures for ourselves on earth. No, moth and rust destroys that. Lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth or rust destroys and where thieves don't break in and they don't steal. You see, um, our choice again is how are we going to live? The text says clearly, you've got a choice. You can't serve God and money at the same time. That's impossible. That's why this text is really a text about blessing, about joy, about really getting the most out of life. I don't know if you've ever seen a hoarder or seen a hoarder's house. Uh, when I first got in ministry, I worked way out in a little community called Tamarack, and uh, there was one large house. The rest were all kind, kind of small, but... The man who owned that house had had something to do with the railroad many, many years ago, 
and now a great niece lived in that house all by herself. She came to the church, and one time I went to visit her, and I never saw anything like it. I mean, when you opened up the front door, you couldn't get in the front door. There was just a tiny little path in every room that you get through. It's called hoarding. But you know, that behavior is not too strange for many of us. There is always the temptation of hoarding what God has given us rather than using it for God and for his kingdom. Christ understood this. In the temptation in Matthew 4, he's led out into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. And there it says that that Satan tempted him by saying, after he hadn't eaten for 40 days, turn these rocks into bread. Notice the material aspect of that. Then he says, look, you believe in God, go up into the, into the top of the temple, throw yourself out off, and God your Father will protect you. He'll take care of you. Another material thing, health and, and, uh, and uh, uh, bodily protection. Something's important to us. And then, the last one was, see all the kingdoms of the world, I'll give them all to you. You can have all the wealth and all the power that exists in the world. Just bow down and worship me. Another material thing, completely. Jesus understood exactly what we have to deal with. It's why he could preach a sermon like this here in chapter 6 of Matthew, because that's the way Satan is going to work on us. That's how he's going to try and tempt us. There's a story about the uh, rich young ruler in Matthew uh, chapter 19, And if you remember the story, this man is a young man, but a very wealthy man. He comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to be saved? Oh, Jesus says, well, here's what you need to do. Honor your father and your mother. Don't lie. Uh, Don't commit adultery. Don't covet. Don't commit murder. You know, the six uh, laws that are the second book of the law, we call them often in the Ten Commandments. And uh, you may think that he was bragging. I don't think so. I I really don't. I think if you'd have gone and asked his neighbors, they would have said, oh, he loves his parents. He doesn't covet. He doesn't steal. He has more than most people have. He hasn't committed adultery. And he hasn't killed anybody. Jesus says, but one thing you lack. Go sell all you have and give to the poor and follow me. Now, that is not a sermon on taking a vow of poverty. That's a sermon on getting things right in your life, and this young man had a problem. He had another God. The Bible says he went away sad because he had much wealth. We all have to hear that sermon. What is it that's really important to us? Do we see the things of God as a blessing to be used to honor Him, glorify Him, and expand his kingdom? Or do we see the blessings he's given us simply for our own use, for, um, for bringing comfort and, and pleasure in our own life? David Livingston put it this way. I will, uh, you remember that he was a great missionary in, in Africa. I will place no value on anything I may possess except as it relates to Christ's kingdom. I will use my wealth to promote Christ's glory, the one to whom I owe everything. And that is the great spiritual divide in our lives. Are we going to invest in Christ's kingdom or are we going to invest in our own lives? Point four is nothing has greater potential to grow your faith and turn turn you to God than investing in God's kingdom. Again, lay up your treasure in heaven. Your life will be full of light. Um, the Bible talks about the fact that we were created for God. We weren't created just for things. You see, if I invest in heaven, I will know the God who lives in heaven better. If I invest in heaven, I will know the Son who has opened the door to heaven for me. If I invest in heaven, I will know the Holy Spirit who has sealed me for heaven better. That's how we get to know God, by how we handle our resources. J. J. Oswald Sanders said this. He said, the question is not, how much of your money are you going to give to God? He said, the question is, how much of God's money are you going to keep for yourself? And I think that's really the emphasis here in this 
text. I know it sounds radical. I said it's in maybe the most radical part of the entire Bible. Yes, it sounds radical, but it really isn't. You didn't create anything. Nothing you have belongs to you, really. It belongs to Him. Uh, you can't save yourself. He paid the price. You bring nothing to the salvation table except your own need. And you only live a short time in this world. Only a short time in this world. You're going to live in eternity there. So where are you laying up your treasures? God wants to bless you. He doesn't want to steal from you. If you don't invest in heaven, then the things that God has given you will actually control you. You won't control them. The only way that you get control of what God has given you if you invest it the way He wants it invested. Any idol will ultimately become your master. Paul Stewart wrote a little poem. It's called, Do You Drive a Dr. Seuss Car? It goes like this. Can your car go from here to there? Can it go anywhere? Can you drive it down the street? Can you park it in a spot? Can you park it in a lot? Have your payments come to an end and your car is your best friend? Now, you see, when you don't have any payments, when you don't have any mortgage, the car's just a much better car, you know? It just drives better. It, it feels better because it's no longer got me. I've got the car. That's sort of what I'm trying to say here. Now, um, with one minute left, uh, I will tell you that I've got six things to tell you, but I'm going to tell them to you awful fast. <laughs> the first, th these are five plus one things that you can do. First, decide what you're going to give. My wife and I, we do it on a yearly basis, and I like that. But what I'm really simply saying here is there's no formula for giving. You've got to decide what you're going to give uh, to the Lord. And it's something you ought to take very seriously and take time to do. Um, we do this once a year in January. Secondly, pray about it. And that seems obvious, but ask God to give you opportunities. Ask Him to give you a generous heart. Those two things. Thirdly, talk with somebody about your giving. Don't be a private. You know, there's certain things we say we don't talk about. <laughs> this is one thing we ought to talk about. If you're married... It's a wonderful way, I think, to bind you together as a, as a couple. If you're not married, I say, and I mean it, call your pastor and talk with him. Say, I want to come and talk to you about my giving. He'll drop over dead because nobody has ever done that before. <laughs> um, four, make it an act of weekly worship. I, we take that very seriously. Now, we plan out our giving, and most of our giving is given in big chunks because of the way our life is with retirement plans and so on like that. I can tell you recently, my wife wrote out all the checks. I won't tell you how much it was, but it was a lot of money. And, and that was just very recently. And three days later, this big storm hit uh, Cuba and Puerto Rico and so on. And we've got a lot of uh, church uh, friends in, in Cuba because we've worked there. And so my wife comes to me and she says, I I'm going to send some money for Cuba. I said, honey, you just sent all the money about a week ago. She didn't say anything. She just smiled and walked away. And uh, she wrote the check, too. Um, finally, uh, this is the fifth one. Finally, practice compound giving. You know what compound interest is? I won't go into that now. But compound giving is a lot like that. Just give a little bit more this year than you gave last year. You will be amazed. You've already heard from just a moment ago, my wife is far more benevolent than I am. But she was surprised when we got married how much money I was giving away. Well, I'll tell you how it happened. I started here, and then I just added 2% per year. And it's amazing, you know, if you live as long as I am, uh, how much money you're giving away. And it doesn't hurt. That's, that's the neat thing about compound giving. It's kind of like compound interest. It just happens. Finally, 5 plus 1, the sixth one, hey, sign up for the seminar. Uh, free lunch or free dinner, and it will be a blessing to you. So I hope that you can come as well. In your outline is this quote from Doug Carter, all Christian steward, stewards I know tell me their greatest joy comes from giving. All Christian stewards I know tell me their greatest joy comes from giving. Let us pray. 
Father, we've been talking about money because you talk about money. We've been focusing on money because, interesting enough, you focus on money. Because you know who we are, you know how you made us, you know what world you put us in, and just like Satan knew, you know what's the greatest temptation. What Satan didn't know is what's also the greatest blessing. When we get a spiritual handle on the things you've given us, both talents and resources, life radically changes in a very positive way. We thank you for that, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Paul. Uh, we come now to the time where we, uh, as a family, church family, if, if you're a guest here, don't worry about this unless God really moves you. But this is for us as a church family to actually apply what, what Paul said because we believe what Paul just said, that we should take time every year to think through uh, 